Welcome to this special edition of Jewish World Weekly on I-24 News. I'm Khaled Ben David. The holiday of Rosh Hashanah has just ushered in the new Jewish year of 5785. But today, we are going to look back at 5784 to choose the outstanding personality of the Jewish world of the Jewish year past. Joining me in studio to make that assessment is our senior correspondent, Owen Alterman, our correspondent, Nicole Sedek, and from Washington, D.C., our senior U.S. correspondent, Mike Wagenheim. Now, I think no hesitation is needed to choose the one event that most influenced the Jewish world over the past 12 months. Indeed, so profound has been the effect of the October 7th attack by Hamas terrorists and the subsequent conflicts that followed in its wake on both Israel and the Jewish diaspora that almost all of our nominees have been chosen on the basis of their actions and reactions to that cataclysmic tragedy. And of course, those people most directly affected are the hostages taken into Gaza by the terrorists and the families that have campaigned for their release ever since. Now, if this was a collective award, it would go to all of them. But if we are looking at individuals, some do stand out for their prominence in the public awareness. Among the hostages, Noah Argamani was distinguished both by the dramatic footage of her capture, her even more dramatic rescue by the IDF, and her subsequent appearances in the media. And among the hostage families, John Poland and Rachel Goldberg were tireless and eloquent advocates here and abroad for the freedom of their son, Hirsch, whose body was finally recovered from a Gaza terror tunnel at the end of the summer. Here's a bit of Rachel Goldberg's powerful speech at last November's rally for the hostages in Washington, D.C. We all have third-degree burns on our souls. Our hearts are bruised and seeping with misery. But the real soul's suffering are those of the hostages. And they want to ask everyone in the world all the screamers, the indifferent, the experts, the academics, the knowledgeable, the passives, the perfectly outraged, the righteous, the indignant, the haters, the leaders, the lovers, the every single one of us. Why? Why is the world accepting that 240 human beings from almost 30 countries have been stolen and buried alive. Panelists, I do think we can all agree, October 7th defines the year, and uh, however we may decide at the end, we have to begin with the hostages and their families, Owen. Yeah, we're in a twin set of crises. Uh, the crisis in Israel is obvious, although, of course, we are hopefully foo-foo, as we say in Hebrew, on our way out of it, and the crisis in America, all too real to so many of our viewers, and what they see and feel around them. Obviously, there's been a resurgence of interest and of activism in the Jewish world, and here in Israel, and of social activism, and that's a silver lining, but they're poetically and passionately describing, as she did in every stage, as she did with her husband on every stage. I of course, the story of her mother, and her connection to her mother right. and her mother's illness, uh, and Noah Argamani's strength and ability to speak so soon after her rescue to the Israeli public and to the world, just incredibly powerful human stories coming out of this horrific year. Nicole. I have to agree with Owen here, and especially going back and, and hearing Rachel speak when it was right after the attack, and then following up with her speeches every day, posting on social media, the passion, the strength in her voice, though, not well, killing right. in Hamas captivity. She continues to speak out for the remaining hostages. and to find the strength to even rip off that piece of scotch tape, put it on her shirt every day, and have a new number out there to continue to fight for all of the hostages. I think her message got across to the world as just the strength of a Jewish mother fighting for her son. Right, and uh, Mike, uh, again, that was in Washington. Uh I mean, you look at uh, Noah Argamani specifically, I mean, she kind of encapsulate that uh, motto that post-October celebrate amidst all the tragedy, and she's really embodied that in a literal sense, uh, you know, after the, the tragedy of her mother passing, of course, her boyfriend still being held uh, already in Israel. This is this encapsulate uh, the Israeli spirit right now. And in terms of the uh, the Pollins and John Pollin, Rachel Goldberg Pollin, I was there at the, the Democratic, much about how divided at least that party was or is 
on the particular issue of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the Israeli-Hamas war and to see the ovation and the embrace that they got uh, under those circumstances really speaks to how they and the other parents have been able to win over um, the, the, the kind of a universal audience to, to be embraced that way, to have their message be heard uh, in such a way that it's really touched so many people that deeply. It really is a, a tribute. Let's move now to the area of politics, diplomacy, security, all of which were interconnected this year. Now, it's no surprise. The Jewish world is going to depend on how much you interpret the events of October 7th and its aftermath. The same has to be said of Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, who ironically came into this Jewish New Year looking like he was heading into political irrelevance. And outside Israel, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, I would say, is probably the most prominent Jewish figure with the most relevance in this area, though his record of diplomatic success the past 12 months, I would say, seems pretty scanty. And panelists, I think now we're in more controversial, contentious uh, area when we look at these figures, out dominant figures in the news, of course, but of question is uh, uh, how much of a role they played in terms of being uh, acting or reacting to the events. Yeah, this isn't the year for the politicians, Kalev. Not in Israel, not in terms of Antony Blinken in the United States. Notwithstanding Antony Blinken's earnestness, right, in visit after visit, I've been at a number of his press conferences that have such a Groundhog Day feel here in Israel as he comes back and back and back. Uh, this is not the year of the politicians. This is the year, I think, for the public, for social activists, for people who've really sacrificed, people who've lost loved ones. And obviously, this is going to very much complicate Benjamin Netanyahu's legacy. Uh, Yoav Gallant is a respected figure here in Israel, but not without his problems as well. Uh, but certainly, we can't live without the politicians, and we can't live with them. But again, I think this is the year where it's, it's time for us to look elsewhere. When it comes to not necessarily the most outstanding, but the most influential, influence can be good and bad, right. Rev. And so when we're looking at Netanyahu, I do think that he is one of the most influential Jewish people of this year. Well, I would think mm. of, of, of this decade and even of this century, exactly. one might say. But the question is, are the events of this year... This isn't the year for him. Right. Exactly. I mean, he's, he's reacting to events that have occurred as opposed to the years when he was setting the agenda, exactly. say, with the Abraham Accords, mm. for example. I completely agree. And so when you're looking at all of this, it, it, it isn't the year for any of these politicians and continuing with just all of the backlash and what we saw even with, against the politicians here in Israel ushering in the Jewish New Year. It has not gotten better over the past year and we'll have to see exactly what is in store for some of these politicians in the year to come. Right. And uh, Mike, a perspective from Washington. Well, it hasn't been a year of politicians. It hasn't been a year for diplomats either, which is what uh, Tony Blinken is. Listen, credit for coming to Israel and saying, I'm, I'm here to represent America, but I'm, first and foremost, I'm, I'm a Jew. Uh, and that took courage to say that in that particular situation. But in terms of what he's been able to accomplish in navigating this crisis, what he or any other diplomat anywhere in the world has been able to accomplish is simply nil. Um, so in, in that respect, uh, not a whole lot of success. Same thing with, uh, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu, you, you've mentioned it, not his year, to say the least. Yoav Gallant, I think, at least deserves credit for being the anti-politician here. He really has stayed outside politics, or at least political speak, as much as possible, and his focus, despite the constant threats to his job, despite uh, the uncertainty of the war, despite being held back in certain, certain circumstances and being overruled, he's really kind of towed the line and been a, a military man as much as you possibly can define one in keeping the war effort going and keeping all the distractions uh, out of the IDF, uh, all, the, all the, the, the distractions that are surrounding it from the political realm right now. And in that respect, Gallant, I think, quietly has gotten the job done where, where so many others have, have failed and, and let uh, politics and other considerations kind of seep into their particular domains. I, I have to agree with you, Mike. He's, and I think uh, it was alluded to that uh, uh, he's the most surprising figure to emerge from this year because a lot of us thought his political career was basically over. Uh, prior to October 7th because of his conflicts with Benjamin Netanyahu. But I think the bottom line here is for all of these men, and especially Benjamin Netanyahu, how we assess 
how uh, th this year was for them, this Jewish year. We have to really look at how this story plays out. And next year may be their year. And may, may be or, or, or may not. But I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the, the ending for, for them, for the story that began October 7th, is far from over. And really, that's going to color how we see them, uh, how they're, all of their actions, all of these three, uh, uh, since uh, past uh, October 7th and the past Jewish year. Now, of course, uh, inside the diaspora, the, uh, uh, the, the Jewish community outside Israel, the main consequence of October 7th has been a shocking surge of anti-Semitism. Everywhere from university campuses to the streets of most major cities, often in the form of anti-Israel or anti-Zionist uh, invective. Now, this development has brought to the fore a number of prominent Jewish personalities, especially in the United States. Perhaps the most notable is Douglas Emhoff, the second gentleman married to Vice President Kamala Harris, who may be moving up to the first rank of White House spouses come this November, maybe. But he was tapped as the Biden administration's official point person on anti-Semitism. Another political figure in the U.S., Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, achieved national renown by almost becoming the Democratic's vice presidential nominee. And his failure to do so also sparked a national discussion there on whether we will ever see such an out-and-out -and, -out and proud Jew in the White House other than in the role of a spouse. Uh, and while Shai Davidai may be little known to the general public, the Columbia University associate professor does deserve credit as one of the first and most insistent Cassandra's, let's say, warning that anti-Semitism on college campuses was a growing threat. But let's listen to a comment from Shai Davidai, uh, and he spoke with us here at I-24 News. After only investigating me for my online presence, so my, my advocacy for the Jewish students, the Jewish faculty, and the Jewish uh, staff at Columbia. Uh, if you look throughout the five months, all I've been doing is speaking up against anti-Semitism and speaking up against student organizations that uh, support Hamas and the Houthis, so supporting terrorism. That's all I've been doing. If I lose my job, you know, that's a price that I'm willing to pay. We have many uh, soldiers in Miluim uh, that are protecting uh, the country, uh, that are trying to retrieve back our hostages. You know, they're paying a much bigger price than I uh, can ever will. Um, and it's a price that I'm willing to pay because the, the, the goal here is way more important. Again, panelists, I don't think we can argue that, at least in the diaspora outside Israel, the surge of anti-Semitism, as I said before, which took the form in many cases of uh, uh, incitement against Israel and against Zionism, is the story. Uh, we're looking for representative figures here, like Shai Davidai, not well known, perhaps to the public, but he really is a key figure in one of the first, being the first to alert uh, the public to this. Uh, let's get your uh, views on this, because I think, again, here, eh, some people are going to have issues with some of the choices. This wasn't a year for gentility in the fight against anti-Semitism. I think this isn't the year for Doug Emhoff. Obviously, he's a prominent figure. He is the point person in anti-Semitism. He's associated with this issue. He talks about his Jewish heritage. But Kalev, the sense I get, and I spent time in the United States this year, is people want the fighter. They want Shai Davidai. That's the emblem. We heard him there in that clip. If I lose my job, that's the price I have to pay. He gives the fight as an emblem at Columbia Ground Zero, right, for the campus protests and the campus activity against Israel. And he is out there, outnumbered, day after day after day, a provocateur, a symbol, and, and really someone who can, in a sense, Kalev, only exist in this horrific year, and a kind of figure who, who emerges from it. And you're right, may not be known to the general public, but he has a higher and higher profile in the Jewish world because of what he does and because of what he symbolizes. And, and when it comes to Douglas Emhoff, he might be the main point person from the White House right now, but as the main point person under his command, then anti-Semitism has run rampant in the United States. You have a person right now with no real action plan, just like uh, Owen is stating, no real fighting words to tackle the anti-Semitism. Instead, he's donating to uh, $2 million to UN different councils. UNESCO, for example, if you want Jews in the world to feel safe, you're likely not going to donate to a United Nations uh, forum like UNESCO. And so that in itself, I think, speaks a lot about 
the message that we're getting out of the White House right now, a lot of words, a lot of words of support as well, stating that anti-Semitism is no place here in the United States, yet we're seeing it firsthand. So clearly they need to switch the, the path that they need if they want to really be considered as some of the prominent figures for the, for the next year. Mike, uh, Douglas Enhoff, who was dubbed the, uh, on Saturday Night Live the sec second gentlemensch and has become somewhat of a celebrity and a high-profile figure. But as you can see here in the view from Jerusalem, less than impressed with the White House's pick uh, to lead the fight against anti-Semitism in the U.S. Listen, I think it's commendable that Doug Emhoff reconnected with his Judaism uh, when uh, it's so high in the, uh, the the public eye as the uh, the second gentleman. But at this time, it's not good enough to light Hanukkah candles and uh, put up the mezuzahs. You've got to do more, especially when you're you're coming out uh, with this national plan for anti-Semitism and you're the point person on it. I think Doug Emhoff, when the fire started, ran. What have we heard from Doug Emhoff in the last three, four, five months? about anti-Semitism, practically nothing. Uh, and it's because it's uh, politically not good for his uh, wife right now to be talking about it, because so much of it is coming uh, from that particular uh, domain, uh, that particular spectrum of, uh, of politics right now. And so he has, he's disappeared on the issue. So yes, great that you're embracing your Judaism, but in terms of fighting anti-Semitism, no, not the guy, not even close to it. It's talking about Shai Davidai, yeah, I, I've kind of watched him up close because, I, you know, I was in New York for, for the longest time. It, it's not just a matter of speaking out against anti-Semitism because there are so many right now, and it's great, there are so many high-profile people speaking out against anti-Semitism and making the media rounds and putting up TikTok and YouTube videos, and it's wonderful. Shai Davida, I think the difference with him has gone into the lion's den. He's there on the Columbia campus, literally fighting and trying to fight to get into the pro-Hamas encampments, which they would not allow him to do for security reasons. He's out there every day challenging the administration, willing to put his job on the line. I, I think that is what separates him right now. Rather than just going on camera, which is wonderful, he's there literally trying to fight to expunge these uh, you know, pro-terror groups uh, from, uh, from college campuses right now, and, and kudos to him. Right, and I'd also say as an academic, not an influencer, he's got a lot more to lose uh, than some of the other people that, uh, 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 that are speaking out. So uh, kudos. Kudos to him. Uh, of course, uh, I'll just comment, if uh, Kamala Harris does uh, attain the White House, it'll be interesting to see the role that uh, Douglas M. Hoff will play there uh, as the most senior Jewish figure, in a he sense. Won't take that, the risks that Shai Davidai is I, taking. I understand that. And if it should be Donald Trump who wins in the election, it'll be see who emerges as the uh, sort of most prominent Jewish figure. Uh, in that, in his uh, administration, uh, and certainly his first go round at the White House, did have some of those personalities, such as Jason Greenblatt and, of course, the ambassador uh, to Israel, uh, David Friedman. Now, we're going to go to a category that is somewhat related to what we just talk about, but there is a difference. These are people not speaking out, not just against anti Semitism, but specifically who have expressed support or represented Israel in the public sphere which was a risky business over the past year. They risked retaliation in the form of harassment, being ostracized, even facing threats verbal, virtual, in cases uh, even physical. I think we can subdivide uh, those Jews who have obtained prominence over the past 12 months in a few categories. There were those celebrities who chose to speak out in support of Israel, despite not necessarily being known as outspoken public figures. Uh, I think the outstanding figure in this regard is Jerry Seinfeld, surely he, the most famous Jewish entertainer who made a solidarity visit here to Israel since October 7th. Uh, there were those celebrities who were thrust into the position of representing Israel and the Jewish people, kind of by circumstance, and I would point here to the singer Eden Golan, who despite her youth handled herself admirably during the Eurovision Song Contest. And finally, those who have taken upon themselves to represent and defend the cause of Israel in the global public arena as sort of a full-time job and have won fame and admiration for doing so. And I think the most notable of those is our former colleague here at I-24 News, Elon Levy, who was the official and is now sort of the unofficial spokesperson uh, for Israel in mainstream and social media. Let's take a look, though, at how Aidan Golan fared handling herself at Eurovision. Have you ever thought that by being here, you bring risk and danger for other participants and public? 
you don't have to answer that question if you want, don't want to. Why not? If you want to, if you want to answer, okay. please. Um, I think we're all here for one reason and one reason only, and uh, the EBU is taking all safety precautions uh, to make this a safe and uh, a united place for everyone. And um, so I think it's safe for everyone, and we wouldn't be here for any other reason. Panelists, uh, your reactions uh, about, uh, I, I won't even say sort of celebrities. These were people who did advocate for Israel. Three towering figures. <laughs> did Jerry Seinfeld using a celebrity everywhere from Israel, as you mentioned, to the United States, to Australia. Think of those videos and how he handled those hostile crowds in Australia. Eden Golan, her story in Eurovision in Malmo. We just saw a bit of it. And Elon uh, Kalev, Elon is one of the best advocates for Israel in the country's history. For me, Eden really did stand out because of just not only being an Israeli here, she, just, she lost so many friends, people, community members, and then to go represent Israel during a time when it was so broken and put out such a powerful song and do so well on a world stage despite all of the harassment and death threats that she got, it was really powerful to see such a strong Israeli woman like that. Mike, one stands out for you? C credit to, to Elon, number one. He, he got fired from his role as a government spokesperson for political reasons. He didn't say, ah, the heck with it. He went out and created a whole citizens spokespersons unit, which is now uh, the leading force uh, for Israeli uh, diplomacy uh, worldwide. It's, uh, it's incredible what he's been able to accomplish there. And in terms of Seinfeld, I really think what sticks out is this was a locks and bagels guy for most of his life. I mean, even within his hit TV show, he barely mentioned Judaism. And in the context, it was all cultural. Suddenly, he's this fighter on behalf of Israel. Israel. Suddenly, he's take, uh, taking the fight uh, to everybody else. I, I think it's quite notable that he's become so uh, politically uh, uh, militant somewhat in his older age in this particular fight. I, I think that really stands out. I agree that Jerry Seinfeld risked the greatest blowback. He's not known as a political comedian at all. And for him willing to take this stance, I think uh, he deserves a special, special kudos. All right, panelists, uh, we're, I should mention there are some notable figures we did not get to. Evan, Jewish figures of the past year, Evan Gershkovitz, uh, released from uh, freedom uh, from Russia. Uh, it speaks a lot to what the experience of Jews, Russian Jews, just any Jews who happen to go into Russia. I think at this time, Vladimir Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, uh, we should mention as well. He could be a perennial candidate over the last three years. By the way, a new president of Mexico, a Jewish woman, Claudia Scheinbaum. We'll see if that plays any role at all uh, in her position there. But I think the time has come to make a decision. Uh, we'll, vote, we'll each give our selection. For me, this is uh, an easy choice. Uh, Rachel Goldberg and John Poland. I think the hostages uh, were the big issue this year, and they spoke out the best in representing the cause of the hostages, both here in Israel and, crucially, internationally as well. And another element, Kalev, because I'm going to, that's also my vote, is the connection that they built between Israel and the Jewish diaspora and American Jews. And again, being at that funeral and seeing the mix of American Israelis living in Jerusalem that was part of their community, and also the fans of the Hapoel Jerusalem soccer and basketball teams, a world apart, but also there as a powerful presence, and seeing them together at that event and seeing how this couple spoke truth to power and two continents into two different communities and to people around the world is incredibly powerful, but also honorable mentions to Shai Davidai and, yes, to our own former colleague, Elon Levy, as I said, one of the best advocates, not only this year, Kalev, but in the 76-year history of the State of Israel. All right, uh, Nicole. Very great honorable mentions, and I have to agree with both of you as well. Rachel and, and John absolutely have my vote. I think they've just given the most powerful history of how to be a genuine human being, fight for what's right right now, despite all of the difficulties that they faced, and really share their message across the international world to both Jews, non-Jews, everyone, just relating to people on the level of humanity. I think they absolutely won this year. And Mike, finally. 
I wish there was some controversy here, but I, I agree with everybody. I think uh, Shai and Elon, uh, a tip of the cap to them, honorable man. And Elon has huge things ahead of him, by the way. But uh, uh, Rachel Goldberg, Paul, and, and John Paul, and uh, just the way they were able to connect on such a human level amidst such uh, inhumanity over the last uh, year or so, uh, it really is, is a, a tribute to them. And to do so under such pressure, under such fire, with such heartache, uh, it's unbelievable the, the amount of people that they've been able to touch over the last year in such a profound way. Right. And I do think if we're singling them out in a way which is a bit unfair for the other hostage friends, part of it is the fact they spoke, as you said, they represented, they created a bridge between Israel and the diaspora, given their U.S. heritage. Another important theme of this year, of how that bridge has been built and how the bond has right. been strengthened. All right. And let us hope, of course, that all the hostages are returned uh, uh, safe and sound as soon as possible. And we do see some peace in this coming year. I want to thank Owen, Nicole, and Mike. And I wanted to wish all our viewers a happy, healthy, and peaceful Jewish New Year. Shana Tova. Thank you for joining us on Jewish World Weekly.